All right, let's begin. So welcome everyone who's here today to the latest uh, guest speaker program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. Uh, I am Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the Institute. And our speaker today is Professor Carol Peterson, who is a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, she's uh, an expert in international law and human rights with a special emphasis on the experience in East Asia. Uh, she taught law in Hong Kong from 1989 to 2006 and has continued to closely follow and research developments in Hong Kong's legal system. Her main areas of research are human rights in Hong Kong and the challenges of implementing the system of one, one country, two systems arrangement that was set up when Hong Kong uh, was reunified with China in 1997. And also she works on uh, the rights of women and persons with disabilities under international and domestic law. For the past few years, we have witnessed a radical deterioration of human rights in Hong Kong. Uh, in particular, uh, the right of assembly and the right of free speech, free press. The legal system has been undergoing uh, a severe test. But anyone who has lived in the city and um, cares about its people, as I have and I do, <laughs> still hopes that Hong Kong courts may serve as a bulwark for freedom. So therefore, I'm especially happy to have Carol uh, join us today to share her observations uh, with some negative conclusions, but also a few more positive conclusions uh, about the continued use of international law in Hong Kong's courts. So Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here. The weather is gorgeous in New York, and I love coming here in the fall. Um, I'm going to assume that most people who have registered for this event have a basic understanding of the situation in Hong Kong. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the framework of one country, two systems. But I do want to emphasize why I'm focusing on the role of international law in the Court of Final Appeals jurisprudence. And that's because one country, two systems really created a special role for international law. If you think about it, the framework for one country, two systems was established in a bilateral treaty registered with the United Nations, the Sino-British Joint Declaration. It provided, in some respects, for Hong Kong to actually have its own international legal personality in the sense that although it's not an independent nation, it could enter into international agreements with other governments. It has its own membership in the World Trade Organization, its own currency. And most important for my research, the Joint Declaration provided that some very important international human rights treaties, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, known as the ICCPR, and other treaties would continue to apply to Hong Kong and be enforced through the laws of Hong Kong. And that, particularly the ICCPR, is significant because although mainland China has signed the ICCPR, it has never ratified it. And therefore, mainland China does not participate in the international reporting process in Geneva, but the Hong Kong government on its own reports, although they submit their report through China, but they are really the ones writing the report and answering the questions when the UN Human Rights Committee reviews its compliance with the ICCPR. And that's the treaty monitoring body for the ICCPR. So international law has always, from the beginning in 1997, I think had a special role in Hong Kong. And it was actually elevated by the enactment of the Bill of Rights Ordinance because Hong Kong incorporated the ICCPR right into its domestic legal system. And that's important because Hong Kong is what we call a dualist legal system. And what that means is that Hong Kong, like the United Kingdom, treats international law and domestic law as separate spheres. And so normally an unincorporated treaty, while it creates obligations for the government, it's not directly enforceable in local courts. Whereas in a monist system, at least in theory, it should be. So by largely copying the ICCPR as it was applied to Hong Kong into a domestic ordinance, the Bill of Rights Ordinance, 
the Hong Kong Legislative Council gave the courts the power and really the mandate to enforce the ICCPR against the Hong Kong government if government action violated it and also to test legislation against it. So that's not to say that other treaties don't matter because as I'll mention later if we have time, there are also other treaties that are technically not incorporated into Hong Kong's legal system or not fully incorporated but where the courts have also used them, sometimes as a guide to interpreting vague language in a treaty, and sometimes to assess government action. And that's been especially important with the Convention Against Torture and asylum seekers, but it's also played a role in some other areas. But what I'm gonna focus on today primarily is the ICCPR because of the special status that it was given in the Joint Declaration, the Hong Kong Basic Law, which is the constitutional instrument and mentions it in Article 39 and this local Bill of Rights ordinance. And we did see in the early years of One Country, Two Systems many examples where the Hong Kong courts did enforce the ICCPR in local litigation. And the other interesting international aspect of One Country, Two Systems is the, the role of foreign judges on the Court of Final Appeal. Um, we've had a group of foreign non-permanent judges who can sit, not in all cases, but have sat in some very important cases over the years in the Court of Final Appeal. And that's, of course, highly unusual to appoint a foreign judge to your apex court, which is what Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal is supposed to be. But the whole point was to give the international community and local residents and the business community confidence that Hong Kong was not simply going to become part of China, but rather was going to maintain this separate legal system and be connected to the rest of the common law world. So that's the basic background. I'm happy to answer any more questions, but I, I think most of you probably know the background. Um, the problem with this lovely system, of course, is that Beijing also sits as a little bit of a shadow over the apex court. And in my draft paper, the title is Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal, an apex court in the shadow of Beijing. And that shadow has shown itself particularly through two powers in the basic law. One is Article 158, which gives the NPC Standing Committee a plenary power to issue interpretations of the Hong Kong basic law. And there was a big fight about that during the drafting of the basic law because Hong Kong lawyers did not like the sound of that at all. They wanted the power to interpret the basic law to rest with the local independent judiciary. In the end, Article 158 is essentially a compromise. The local judges can and do interpret the basic law in the course of deciding cases, but any time Beijing wants to, it can issue an interpretation and thereafter the courts have to follow it. And the really tricky part about it is that in China, interpretations can essentially be amendments, right? They're legislative interpretations. And there are now lots of examples where the NPC Standing Committee has essentially added new language to the basic law. The other problem with it is we had always hoped that Beijing would be very reticent to issue interpretations. In the beginning, some people hoped that they would develop a constitutional convention where they would almost never issue an interpretation. But over time, as conflicts over democracy increased, Beijing became more and more willing and more and more aggressive, I would say, in the issuing of interpretations, sometimes while litigation was actually pending, which is clearly a, an interference with this idea that Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal is supposed to be the court, the apex court for now, the other way in which Beijing acts as a shadow is under Article 18 of the Basic Law. They have the power to apply a national law to Hong Kong. Once again, in the beginning, there was very little use of this power. The list of national laws that applied to Hong Kong is very small and very particular, things like the flag law, right? It wasn't all that influential in Hong Kong. But with 2020 and the national security law, that has completely changed. And I think most commentators would agree that the national security law has now fundamentally changed Hong, Kong legal, Hong Kong's legal system, not across the board, but in a particular area, and that is political offenses. So it's had a profound effect on freedom of expression, assembly, association, but also a profound effect on the right to fair trial and on criminal procedure. It's almost as if there is a separate legal system operating now in Hong Kong, 
And now you have far more security institutions where Beijing has direct representation and security officials essentially acting in Hong Kong in a way that they did not have authority to do prior to 2020. So the question then is with this change and with many of the foreign judges resigning from Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal as a result, does international law still matter in the Court of Final Appeal? Or are we going to see a gradual pulling back? Because how do you enforce the ICCPR while also enforcing the national security law? It's not an easy matter. So in the beginning of my paper, I discussed the bad news, which is frankly, in security related cases, the ICCPR has not had much impact at all in these security related cases. Um, we saw a hopeful note, perhaps, in the Lai Chi Ying case, Jimmy Lai's case, um, when his bail was being discussed. And, you know, he had, in fact, been granted bail with very strict restrictions. Um, but the Court of Final Appeal said, no, you have to enforce specific provisions in the national security law. And those specific provisions essentially shift the burden of proof. It used to be that it was the government's burden to show you shouldn't be given bail. Now it's the other way around. And even though the national security law says in Articles 4 and 5 that Hong Kong residents will continue to enjoy human rights and refers in Article 4 to the ICCPR, basically the Court of Final Appeal said a specific provision in the national security law must be enforced. And the Court of Final Appeal has also now confirmed in the 2024 case that it has absolutely no power to review any legislative acts of the NPC state. And this has been coming for a while, but er early in the days of One Country, Two Systems, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal was a little more nuanced. It would say, we don't have the power to question acts by the NPC Standing Committee that are taken in accordance with the basic law, which kind of leaving open the possibility that maybe we could judicially review an act of the NPC Standing Committee if it was not in accordance with the basic law. But over time, Beijing has made it very clear that if the Court of Final Appeal tries to push that, they will not hesitate to intervene. And I think we saw that particularly when Jimmy Lai tried to hire foreign counsel. Timothy Owen, some of you probably read about that in the newspaper. Um, the Hong Kong government did not want a, a British lawyer coming to defend Jimmy Lai in his current case under the national security law where he's been accused of foreign collusion. And it went through the courts. Court of Final Appeal said, we don't see any reason why you can't hire a foreign lawyer, right? Because this particular case really doesn't involve any state secrets. The case is based on the allegation that Jimmy Lai was publicly calling for sanctions right, against Hong Kong and Chinese governments. No state secrets there, right? Um, so the Court of Final Appeal dismissed the government's appeal from the Court of First Instance decision, which said that Timothy Owen could be admitted and represent the part of the defense team. Well, Beijing didn't waste much time. <laughs> it essentially issued the first um, interpretation of the national security law. This was not an interpretation of the basic law, but of the uh, national security law. And essentially what they said was, we're going to leave it to the National Security Committee, the local committee, which is essentially the Hong Kong government with some Beijing representation, to decide whether a foreign lawyer can be admitted. And then they said no. And then the court said, okay, he can't be admitted. So I think that this last statement which is interesting because it was in a, a case that didn't actually involve the national security law, the 2024 decision. This was actually an appeal by Margaret Ung and a group under the public order ordinance. So there was actually no reason for the, for the Court of Final Appeal to say anything about its ability to review acts of the NPC Standing Committee. So I'm not sure why they said it in this decision, but it may partly be because the Court of Final Appeal wants us to know we're simply not going to be able to intervene in anything that the NPC Standing Committee decides. If it's an interpretation, we're going to have to follow it. If it's a national law put on, on Annex 3, we're going to enforce it. 
our decision as judges is either you enforce those laws and those interpretations, or if you can't, you resign. There's no way that we are going to try to judicially review or change that. Um, so I, I see this last decision as kind of the Court of Final Appeals pragmatic recognition that Beijing can easily amend the basic law or the national security law via interpretation. They can add all the clauses they want. And so perhaps there's no point if you're on the Court of Final Appeal to in challenging Beijing and just attracting more interpretations. Now that doesn't mean though that the courts cannot use the ICCPR as a guide to interpreting the national security law because there is in fact a lot of language in the national security law which is ambiguous. And it's certainly arguable, I would say irrefutable, that since Article 4 of the National Security Law says that the ICCPR still applies, that if there's ambiguous language, you should try to interpret the National Security Law to comply with the ICCPR. But we're really not seeing that, in my opinion. If you think about some of the trials, say the first conviction, the Tungin Kit case, where the motorcycle driver was convicted of terrorism, as well as incitement to secession because he drove through some police barriers and flew a banner that said glory to Hong Kong. Um, if you read that decision, there is not one mention of the ICCPR. There was no effort to interpret the elements of the offense of these new offenses in a way that would comply with the ICCPR. I had hoped at the time, and I remember writing a critique of the case, and many other commentators did as well, I had hoped that at some point on appeal, that might be corrected. But there was no appeal in the end. He initially had filed an appeal, but then he withdrew it rather mysteriously. And actually, if you go online, you'll see that he's now kind of the model prisoner um, being touted about as graduating from some kind of educational program um, and blaming social media for his bad acts, right? in 2020. And so in that case, no chance for the appellate courts to consider whether the ICCPR should be applied. Another example is the conviction of the speech therapist for sedition, um, conspiracy to commit sedition. There, the court did discuss the ICCPR and purported to take it into account, but then pretty quickly dismissed it. Right? and also dismissed international and comparative materials as not really appropriate to the circumstances of Hong Kong. That's a real change from the days when the Court of Final Appeal and the lower courts would regularly reach out for international and comparative jurisprudence. They would cite the general comments of the UN Human Rights Committee. They would cite decisions by the European Court of Human Rights. Now we have in the speech ther therapist case a real rejection of that. Uh, a sense of those foreign sources simply don't apply to Hong Kong. We're a special situation. We also see increasingly um, the courts accepting the Hong Kong government's narrative of what happened in 2019. It wasn't peaceful protests with some unfortunate incidents of violence and property damage. It was a violent series of riots, et cetera, et cetera, complete breakdown of social order. And we see this in the language, not only the lower courts, but also in some opinions of the Court of Final Appeal, where there seems to be an, a willingness to accept the Hong Kong government's narrative of what 2019 was all about. So although I conclude at the end of this slide that, you know, I mean, there are some exceptions. Chow Hung Tung managed to successfully challenged the reporting restrictions. And that was a real victory, in my opinion. And that opinion does cite the ICCPR, though it doesn't rely entirely on it. Uh, but we really don't see many examples where international law is making a difference now. I had hoped it might be able to mitigate the impact of the national security law. And I wrote an article for the Hong Kong Law Journal not too long ago called asked whether the ICCPR is window dressing or a meaningful constraint now in Hong Kong. And I think right now I would have to say kind of window dressing. Um, I think it's a little too soon to be sure because we do have some appeals that may work their way to the Court of Final Appeal. One would be the appeals of the 14 who were recently convicted of subversion, right? 
I think there is a very strong argument to be made on appeal regarding what the court pointed to as the unlawful means, because the definition of subversion requires proof of unlawful means. And what the court cited were two provisions in the basic law regarding the role of legislative counselors that do not create either civil liability or criminal liability. So I think that's a very strong ground of appeal, but we'll see what happens. Um, so it's, I would say in this area, pretty negative as to whether the national security law can be mitigated through international. However, this is the more positive side of the presentation, what Catherine wanted here. Um, in non-security cases, we do still see citations to the ICCPR, and in a meaningful way, we see many cases where the courts are, in fact, ruling against the government. Now, this slide I won't spend too much time on because this is all pre-2020. These are the cases where members of the LGBT community successfully challenged laws and government policies. So, originally, up until in 1989, when I moved to Hong Kong, gay sexual relations between men were still a criminal offense. It was that old British law that had never been reformed. And the Hong Kong government took the initiative to reform it partly when the Bill of Rights Ordinance was being debated because they knew it would be invalid. But they only partly decriminalized. They maintained an unequal age of consent, for example, and other discriminatory provisions. Well, in these first two cases in 2006 and 2007, those discriminatory criminal provisions were successfully challenged. Then we saw a series of challenges in 2013, 2018, and 2019 where other non-criminal discriminatory laws and government policies were successfully challenged. So in RV Registrar of Marriages, we had a successful challenge on the right, the right of a trans woman mar to marry in her gender, her assigned gender now. Um, we had in QTV Director of Immigration, a case that successfully obtained the right for a visa for a same-sex spouse. There's no same-sex marriage yet in Hong Kong, but the same-sex marriage had occurred overseas. And then we also had in the Lung Chun Kwong case, a challenge which achieved equal benefits for civil servants and tax treatment for a civil servant who had married overseas. So what about post-2020? Um, my co-author on, on this part of the paper, Kelly Loper and I, we, we are doing a paper that compares the evolution of LGBT rights in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan that we presented at the Law and Society meeting this summer, and we're refining it now. But one of the striking things about LGBT rights in Hong Kong is that we still see the Court of Final Appeal ruling against the government. So in QV Commissioner of Registration, decided in 2023, the court held that the government cannot refuse to change gender markers on identity cards of uh, two transgender men simply because they had not undergone surgery. Court of Final Appeal applied the right to privacy, which is protected in Article 14 of the Bill of Rights Ordinance and is identical to Article 17 of the ICCPR. And initially, the government refused, they just failed to revise the policy guidelines. And so another legal challenge was filed in March 2024. And finally, the government has agreed that they're going to implement the judgment. So it shows us two things. One, that the Court of Final Appeal is willing to rule against the government. Two, they will use international law to justify their decision, or at least to support it. And the government eventually will give in. And there is no in my opinion, way they could get an interpretation of the basic law to change it because it's based on local ordinances, the Bill of Rights Ordinance. Similarly, in 2023, uh, the Court of Final Appeal issued a declaration that the government is in breach of a positive obligation under, again, Article 14 of the Bill of Rights Ordinance to establish at least some legal framework for same-sex couples to give them legal recognition. The court did not agree that there's any right to marriage, but said you have to at least give them something like a civil union and gave the government two years to comply. And I think this was somewhat strategic. I think the Court of Final Appeal did not want to deal with right to marry. If they did, they might have to get into the basic law where, and there might be a possibility of a reinterpretation. Instead, they focused on the Bill of Rights Ordinance right to privacy. They did not go as far as uh, providing a right to marriage. And I know some people have criticized them for that, but I actually think it was a strategic thing to do. 
And it shows they're still relying largely, I think, on the UN Human Rights Committee's jurisprudence, because that is also the position of the UN Human Rights Committee under the ICCPR. They have not said that governments must provide a right to marry, but at least an equivalent for legal recognition. Now, we also have some other really interesting cases that are pending. Um, so the Court of Appeal held in two important cases against the housing authority that the government was unlawfully um, discriminating in housing policy. And the Court of Final Appeal heard the government's consolidated appeals in October 2024, just, just this month. And we are expecting a decision probably within a month or so. And based on some of the comments that were made by the judges in the hearing before the Court of Final Appeal, I think the government's going to lose again. And one of the more amusing comments was the government's um, very expensive King's Counsel from London. I think that's funny that they didn't want Jimmy Lai to have King's Counsel for London, but they have hired King's Counsel from London to defend their discriminatory policies. Anyway, um, they made the argument that it was perfectly rational and legitimate purpose for the Hong Kong government to give priority in public housing to heterosexual couples because it's a pro-birth policy. We want people to have more children. We're worried about our low birth rate. And the King's Council argued that while same-sex couples could have children, it's more complicated, it's not as easy, and therefore it's rational, essentially. I'm oversimplifying it. But one of the members of the Court of Final Appeal asked, well, really, if we take that argument all the way to its logical conclusion, wouldn't a female-female couple have more chances to reproduce and have a better chance of meeting your policy goals of encouraging births. And I think that some of those comments indicate that there's a very good chance the Court of Final Appeal is going to rule against the government in these two consolidated appeals by the Hong Kong Housing Authority. Now, we also have another one that is pending. Um, regarding intestate's inheritance laws. And this is a sad case. Many of these are sad cases because one member of the couple, Edgar, um, um, passed away. And his surviving partner it has taken up the case and arguing that the intestate inheritance laws, which apply when there is no will, um, violate his rights. And once again, I think there's a very good chance that the Hong Kong government is going to lose these cases. In my opinion, it would be much better if the Hong Kong government would simply accept these decisions without even appealing them all the way up to the Court of Final Appeal. I mean, if you go back to the early days of one country, two systems, there were cases where the Hong Kong government lost and did not appeal. I mean, I remember I was writing about a case um, brought against the government's system of allocating students to secondary schools. And the challengers, the Equal Opportunities Commission, was judicially reviewing the government, arguing that it discriminated against girls. And the Court of First Instance cited the CEDAW Treaty. Even though it had not been fully incorporated into Hong Kong, it, they used it as a guide to interpreting Hong Kong's sex discrimination ordinance and said the government had to change. And you know, I'll give the government credit, they didn't jump up and down and appeal and take it all the way up to the Court of Final Appeal. They accepted the decision. And there were other cases brought um, under the discrimination laws where the, the government was more accepting of the court's analysis. Now what we're seeing is the Hong Kong government is challenging everything all the way up to the Court of Final Appeal. And in some cases, um, with respect, for example, to the gender identity markers, really dragging their feet with respect to complying. It will be very interesting to see if they comply within the two-year limit to give same-sex couples legal recognition. Some people think they won't, that they'll just drag their feet. We'll see what, what happens. Um, we, re we hear repeatedly now that the Hong Kong government wants to improve the Hong Kong story internationally, rebuild confidence in Hong Kong, and tell a better story about Hong Kong. If you read the South China Morning Post regularly, that's all you hear about how we have to promote Hong Kong and bring back business, because Hong Kong has definitely suffered in recent years. 
And in my opinion, if the Hong Kong government really wants to do that, a smart strategy would be perhaps let up a little bit on the enforcement of the national security law and the constant talk about the importance of enforcing national security, and instead show a little bit more liberal, progressive thought in areas like LGBT rights. Um, but in any event, for the purposes of my research, this is a more positive area where you really can see that international law is having a positive impact. And I think it raises some interesting questions for what we want Hong Kong judges to do. Um, there's a lot that's written in the press about Hong Kong judges. Some members of Congress have even proposed sanctioning Hong Kong judges for their role in enforcing the national security law. I understand where that critique is coming from, but I think it's important to remember that there are 7 million people living in Hong Kong, and the vast majority of them are not going to leave. And they are affected by all areas of Hong Kong law. And for them, it might be better if competent judges stay in their positions, even if it sometimes means doing things that are not very attractive to them and not consistent with the ICCPR. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I can understand why judges, particularly foreign judges, might want to resign. However, I'm not sure it's necessarily the best thing for Hong Kong if they do. It might be better to have some foreign judges there to write some dissenting opinions on occasion um, and to make the point that enforcement of the national security law is not always consistent with the ICCPR. Um, another area that I won't spend too much time on because I know we want to save time for questions is one of the other areas where international law has made a difference is with respect to the Convention Against Torture. Hong Kong is not bound by the Refugee Convention, and that is because both the British governments and China's governments agreed not to apply the Refugee Convention. Um, and the Hong Kong government insists repeatedly that the duty of non refoulement is not customary international law. That's debatable, but they're essentially trying to show them that they're a persistent objector. Right, if that is an evolving norm of customary international law. I'm not really sure a regional government can be a persistent objector, but they certainly try to take that position. However, under the Convention Against Torture, Hong Kong does have an international obligation under Article 3 of the Convention not to deport someone who has a well-founded fear of torture. And in the beginning, the Hong Kong government really was not enforcing that or adhering to that obligation at all. They were simply relying on the UNHCR to screen applicants. And if someone was screened out as a refugee, because they did allow the UNHCR to screen in Hong Kong and settle people elsewhere. If, if the person was screened out as a refugee by the UNHCR, then the Hong Kong government just assumed that, well, they also don't have a viable claim as a torture claimant. But if you think about the definitions in the two treaties, they might overlap, but they're different. It's possible that you don't fit the definition of refugee, but that you do fit the definition of a torture claimant, even an ordinary criminal who's fleeing a criminal justice system where people are tortured could have a viable claim. And the Court of Final Appeal recognized this in the Prabhakar case. Um, and that was a case where the Court of Final Appeal held that you need to be held accountable for your stated policy of not deporting persons with a well-founded fear of torture. And it was interesting because Hong Kong's local torture ordinance did not replicate Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture. But the Court of Final Appeals said, nonetheless, you've been telling the Committee Against Torture when you report uh, under that treaty that you don't deport those people. So until you announce a different policy, we're going to hold you accountable. And there are other cases that I won't go into where the Court of Final Appeal has gradually increased the protection um, for people under this approach. They expanded it to people who had a well-founded fear of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment and punishment. And they also, in CV Director of Immigration, applied the approach of Prabhakar to protect even asylum seekers, even though Hong Kong is not bound by the refugee convention. So I think this is another area to watch to see whether the Hong Kong courts still do enforce this, these aspects of international law. So finally, last slide. Um, my conclusion so far, although it's somewhat tentative, is that international law does definitely still matter in areas of law that are not related to security or to Beijing's court interests, where 
the courts can enforce international law against the local government without coming into direct conflict with Beijing. Um, and the ICCPR is the most influential, but there's other jurisprudence such as that under CAT that shows that other unincorporated treaties can also be un influential. But right now, it's really not having much impact on the security-related cases. And I would have to say that although we don't have much data yet on the new national security ordinance that was enacted in March 2024, I suspect it's going to be the same. I suspect our, the local courts in Hong Kong may pay lip service to the ICCPR, but in the end, they're going to rely very heavily on the fact that the ICCPR does provide for exceptions for national security and public order, and they're going to accept the government's narrative that this strict enforcement is necessary to protect public order and national security. I may be wrong. Um, it's possible that in some of the appeals that might work their way up to the Court of Final Appeal, the, maybe the court will take a more robust approach, but I'm not as optimistic as I used to be about that. Um, and so that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. You've made a really solid argument that even though we always focus on the ICCPR, we focus, especially here in the U.S., where that's one you know, of the few we've ratified. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's the one we can we, we give priority to. You know um, that even though all of that is kind of now in this special zone of its own, mm -hmm. um, that there's a good case to be made that um, what the court is doing in the name of being strategic, as you said. Um, still allowing itself or trying to preserve space for itself to enforce other treaty provisions and other kinds of um, international law considerations. You've made a case that this Well, is and just, just to drop in, I would say to enforce the ICCPR in non-security areas. Itself. Because in yes. the LGBT okay. cases, they're relying on the Bill of Rights order. Which, which right right to privacy, mm -hmm. which comes from the ICCPR ultimately. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. fair enough. So, I guess I'm wondering what the practical implications of this would be. And you, you started to talk about this a little bit when you mentioned that there are some members of our Congress who have called just individually. I'm not aware. I don't think this has been put into any draft. No, uh, I don't think although so. Although Congress no. has a lot of bills. Um, if, if you don't follow it, there's actually a website um, that, that tracks all the legislation that is proposed, doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily even make it to committee. <laughs> But it's right. proposed in Congress and in the Senate relating to China and Hong Kong. And mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot. There are hundreds and hundreds now uh, of, of bills pending all the time, and most of them go anywhere. But in this case, I don't think there's been legislation. It could be wrong. But um, there is this oral call to mm -hmm. sanction judges. And, and just generally, um, the US government has taken various kinds of moves to punish the government of Hong Kong and increasingly treat it as not being distinct, less and less treated sure. as being distinct from that of, of the people of public of China, to, to chew away or nibble away at its independent uh, status. At its international legal personality. Exactly. Right. That international yeah. legal personality is being, is being attacked. Um, so do you think, as again, being strategic, if you were in DC making an argument, or Berlin, or London, or wherever, is that the wrong strategy to follow? Is that not helpful? What would you What would you suggest is the strategy that human rights advocates uh, should be following? It's a difficult question. I and I don't think the answer will be the same in all situations. So, just to give an example, I think foreign governments are perfectly in their right when they suspend extradition treaties to Hong Kong. Right? That makes sense. <laughs> uh, they entered into these extradition and you know, judicial cooperation agreements because they had faith in the Hong Kong legal system and they had faith that if they sent a criminal defendant, someone who had absconded from Hong Kong, sent him back to trial in Hong Kong, well, then they would get a fair trial in Hong Kong. There would be no risk of re-extradition now, with the national security law, that's not necessarily the case. First of all, the rules of criminal procedure are really different now if you're charged with a national security offense. 
But secondly, the national security law does provide in limited circumstances for extradition to Northern Ireland. So I think, of course, that makes sense. You shouldn't treat Hong Kong as a completely separate legal system for that purpose anymore, because frankly, it's not. That may offend the Hong Kong government and maybe some judges, but I wouldn't want to be part of that agreement. I think it's also fair for governments to, you know, governments were engaging in trade in certain sensitive items with Hong Kong that they might not engage with Beijing. They're changing that as well. That makes sense. Then there are other ways in which the US government responded to the crackdown in Hong Kong that I don't think were helpful. Uh, when Donald Trump insisted that Hong Kong goods be labeled made in China, I just think that was a slap in the face to Hong Kong businesses who had nothing to do with creating the problems that have occurred. Um, and the Hong Kong government challenged that in the World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. and they, they were right, basically. I think as long as the Hong Kong government has its own separate membership in the World Trade Organization, they, are, they do deserve to have separate labeling. And what does it accomplish for us to right, exercise that? Then there are some others that might be in the middle. Um, where some people might think that a sanction is a good way of expressing our anger and our disapproval, and other people might think that it's counterproductive. And I mm -hmm. think good people can, right? I think there are some that are here and some, some are in the middle. Um, the problem with sanctioning judges, though, I, I personally do not approve of that uh, because I think the judges are between, you know, between a rock and a hard place. Their choice is really, if, if you're one of those judges who's designated as a national security judge, mm -hmm. you have an obligation to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that it's fair to criticize judgments that don't take into account the ICCPR, that maybe interpret the elements of the offense too broadly, um, which I and many other people have done mm -hmm. with respect to the conviction of the uh, Kit, but also the speech therapist, a lot of us have published articles saying those judgments were wrong. But are, are people, are, so, are scholars in Hong Kong pu putting their names on articles that say those judgments are wrong? Yes, there are some. They might say it in a little, little less strongly worded than, but I have seen some drafts, especially for a book project that I'm involved in, where someone who is still teaching in Hong Kong has been pretty strong in saying this was wrong, the Court of Final Appeal must correct this mm -hmm. on appeal, but it was in connection with the subversion. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the point that I made about unlawful means, mm -hmm. I have seen local academics make that same point. Uh, now, of course, you have to be a little careful if you're mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, and you have to be careful that you're not calling for sanctions against the Hong Kong government, I mean, because although there are many vague offense, vaguely defined offenses in the national security law, that one's pretty clear. If you call for a sanction against the Hong Kong government or China, you're committing an offense. And it doesn't matter whether you do it here in New York or you do it in Hong Kong. If, if you are a Hong Kong permanent resident, wherever you do it, and regardless of whether you are successful, you've committed an offense. If you're not a Hong Kong permanent resident, you're, you're only considered to have committed an offense if you successfully had to enforce it. So there are some things where you have to be very careful, but I think that academic criticism, if you footnote everything and you're careful about it, I don't think it's an offense. At least I've been assured of that by my former colleagues. I hope I'm right. Um, I think, again, there are some gray areas, things like participating in um, the treaty monitoring process. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I have argued is that the Hong Kong government, and this is in a different paper, really needs to rethink their approach to the treaty monitoring bodies. Because in the old days, pre-2020, the Hong Kong government was generally very polite with the treaty monitoring bodies. They would write their report, they would engage in dialogue, and when they received the concluding observations, they may not implement everything, but they would try to implement something usually, and they would always be very respectful. Now, if you look at the Hong Kong government's website, when the treaty monitoring body issues concluding observations, uh, the Hong Kong government just lashes out and accuses them of lying. And, you know, it really sounds like it was written by Beijing. And again, that 
not only is it a bad look for Hong Kong, but I think it frightens NGOs who might participate in that process. And the Human Rights Committee came right out and asked the Hong Kong government in its last review, will you promise not to retaliate against NGOs and NGO representatives who provide information to us? And I have never heard such a roundabout answer. I mean, they kept trying to avoid answering the question. And in the end, someone from the Hong Kong delegation said, it would depend on the circumstances, <laughs> right? As long as what you do is lawful, we won't prosecute you. That sort of thing. Um, so I have argued that there's no way that providing information to a treaty monitoring body should be considered foreign collusion because they have no coercive enforcement powers. They couldn't sanction Hong Kong or China or anything else. All they are doing is making recommendations. So how could be providing information to a body that can only issue recommendations for inclusion? But there are people who are very worried about it. And all you have to do is look at the number of critical NGO reports, what we call shadow reports. They have since 2020, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, a lot of the organizations that were providing these reports were shut down because they were afraid of being prosecuted. So. If the Hong Kong government wants to regain its reputation, there are a lot of practical things it could do while still fulfilling its obligation to enforce the national security law. The question is, are they going to continue to go over, over the top, which is what they're doing? Um, or are they going to try to take a slightly different approach and come up with some policies that might actually help the Hong Kong people making housing more affordable and other things? There's a terrible, terrible housing shortage in Hong Kong and an enormous number of people who are living in substandard housing. You've right. probably read about the cage homes and whatnot. Uh, that kind of action to better comply with its obligations under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, I think would actually gain, would provide a lot of positive publicity for the Hong Kong government. But rather than focusing on that, they seem to be focusing right now still on this I think overly harsh enforcement. And, and how do you assess the way the international, the UN treaty bodies have responded to Hong Kong, have assessed Hong Kong? Because they did, um, they've gone through a couple of different mm -hmm. um, reviews since 2020, uh, including CEDAW. And um, well, I'm not sure all of the ones you can tell me, but what do you think of the way they approach the new Hong Kong? I think in general, they've done a good job. They have not hesitated to criticize the government. Um, the one critique I would make is that sometimes these treaty monitoring bodies have called upon the Hong Kong government to repeal the national security law, which it obviously does not do. It doesn't have the power to do it. So I would suggest that they make those recommendations more nuanced, call upon them to adhere to the ICCPR in their enforcement efforts, right, to take very seriously their duty not to disproportionately restrict freedom of expression, et cetera, in order um, to comply with their international obligations. But I think in general, they've done a pretty good job. Um, it, in some ways, it's remarkable that Hong Kong does still get um, separate attention, because if you think about the size and population of China, it's pretty tiny. Um, it's not surprising it gets separate attention from the Human Rights Committee because mainland China doesn't report under the ICCPR. But when you're looking at the CEDAW Treaty, for example, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, other treaties, ISCRA, Hong Kong reports along with China, it does still get a separate set of concluding observations, so does Macau. But sometimes they get a little muddled. And it's, I, I think, some of the committees are maybe not doing as good a job as they could of keeping Hong Kong and Macau separate. They'll ask questions altogether, Hong Kong this, mainland China that, and at the end, you don't really have a sense of what their view is about Hong Kong. But maybe that's inevitable because Hong Kong is so small. So that's, that's another reason why I think the Human Rights Committee is doing what they're doing. You mentioned a number of specific cases, um, and I'd like to get back to Jimmy Lai and mm -hmm. Cho Hong Kong. But first, there was one case that suddenly occurred to me, listening to you, that you didn't talk about and is really interesting, and that's the um, the injunction that the courts oh. agreed uh, to give the government against Glory to Hong Kong, right. which was the 
the song it's been called the anthem of the 2019 protests right and the government had said that it was secessionist and it was ticked off that when you searched on google and i don't know probably other search engines if for the right. national anthem of hong kong particularly in the setting of sports competition international sports competition frequently the first thing you would see that would come up would be glory to Hong Kong. And so it was incredibly interesting in 2021, I think even into 2022, several international sporting competitions, uh, the, they were playing when the, Hong Kong, Hong Kong. when the Hong Kong team won or advanced in something, they were playing glory to Hong Kong rather than the, March. the March of the Volunteers, which is the anthem of China, right. which is now Hong Kong's anthem. So this just was really very annoying to Beijing and Hong Kong. And so they asked, apparently they, from what they've said, they asked Google directly and Google mm -hmm. declined to take it down. Yeah, Google's declined, policy is not to mess with what comes up. Right. Uh, and I guess it was specifically YouTube that they also used YouTube, which was owned by Google. So they declined to remove it. So the government applied to the courts for an injunction, arguing why this was harmful. Um, and the court initially responded by saying, no, you haven't made a case. Um, and, then, and then the government appealed and they went back and they reheard the arguments and they flipped their position. Do you want to unpack yeah. how that happened? Because that looked from the outside like the court giving in. Yes, well, actually, I think if you read the court's first decision in which it said no, it said no in a way that kind of wrote the playbook for how the Hong Kong government could get the injunction. I think if you look at it, it they didn't say, no, you can't, because that would be an unconstitutional restriction on freedom of expression. They basically said, no, that really wouldn't be useful to you. And But then they described in a way what might be the possible case, right? So in, in essence, I think that first decision was giving in um, and saying, and this is kind of sometimes the way the Hong Kong courts operate. They will, they will try to hold the line in the sense that they're not, they're just not going to give the Hong Kong government whatever they ask for unless they fit it, they meet their requirements, right? Uh, they're not just going to enjoin this and enjoin that. But sometimes they'll issue a decision saying no that says, this is what you need to do. <laughs> and then we might give you the injunction. And I think that's and in some ways, it didn't surprise me that much because already we had seen cases where people had been convicted on the basis of a statement, right? I mean, the Tung Ying Kit case, right? Um, that was considered incitement to secession, even though there were many expert witnesses who testified that there were many different interpretations of that slogan. And it wasn't necessarily a slogan that was calling for Hong Kong independence. It could be a slogan that was calling for the restoration of the freedoms that Hong Kong people thought they deserved under one country, two systems. So more for our rights as a special administrative region. But the court very much honed in on the expert testimony that is long and, and basically said as long as one of the meanings, one of the possible meanings of the banner that he was flying from his motorcycle was calling for secession. If one of those possible meanings is calling for secession, then you can be guilty of incitement to secession. To me, that was a pretty extraordinary finding, and that was why I had hoped that case would go up on appeal. Um, but it didn't. And so now that case gets cited all the time, especially in district court, you know, lower level cases, they cite that court of first instance decision. So I think the courts had already decided that it was perfectly acceptable within Hong Kong's legal system now to designate certain statements as almost prima facie unlawful. Mm. Okay. He has, of course, he has the funds to litigate. <laughs> yes, he does. Uh, because uh, I think everybody uh, here and and uh, on. I know as well, he was the publisher of Apple Daily. He had previously become a very rich businessman through his um, line of clothing, uh, Giordano. Um, right. And um, I still have some Giordano. 
<laughs> I wonder if there was anything. Yeah, maybe. Um, so he has the money to hire the best legal counsel and every incentive, of course, to, to, to do so. And so he's been charged with a number of different things. And each step of the way, he has his team has, has litigated everything they can. They've litigated procedural questions as well as substantive questions. Mm -hmm. um, they've had a few wins, not very many, mostly losses. Um, but I think you mentioned one in the paper that you wrote that um, deals with this question of uh, international law in Hong Kong courts. You mentioned, for example, him being given bail. On point he was. The court on. of first instance had granted him bail with very strict conditions. Government and, and, appeal. And this was the, on the charge, which charge was it? Collusion. Bail? Foreign collusion. Foreign collusion. So a national, national security charge. Right. Where the presumption is no bail. Right. And so that was a very important case that went up to the Court of Final Appeal. And in 2021, the Court of Final Appeal held that the new bail provision had to be strictly enforced. Because what, essentially what the Court of First Instance had tried to do was to take that provision but interpret it more in line with Hong Kong's system for bail, right? And, and that judge also did impose some very strict conditions for it. It would have been almost like house arrest, but at least he would have been home. Uh, and then the Court of Final Appeals said, no, that is, you're misconstruing the clear intent of that provision. It is, in fact, the case that the NPC Standing Committee meant almost impossible. Not impossible, but. Mm -hmm. And I think it was an interesting case because on one hand, that's also the case where the Court of Final Appeals cited Articles 4 and 5 of the National Security Law. Those, and that's the article that refers to the ICCPR. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, a lot of us were citing it for the proposition that lower courts, you should do everything you can to interpret provisions of the NSL to be compliant with the ICCPR. But on the other hand, if there is a very specific provision, you can't rewrite it to make it comply with the ICCPR. Over time, however, I have to say, I, I've been disappointed with some of the other opinions of the Court of Final Appeal. I mean, for example, in the speech therapist case, there was a question of whether the special procedures for security cases applied to cases under the old British sedition law mm -hmm. before they had reformed it, changed it in 2024. And the court said, yes, they're security related cases as well. Mm -hmm. So they kind of imported a lot of these special criminal procedures, even into cases that were not being tried under the NSL. And so it's hard to that? tell where the court of final appeal is going on that. But back to Jimmy Lai, sorry. Well, but, yeah. but to stay a minute with that, was the court doing that? on its own, or was the government arguing for them to do that? It was a combination, in, in the sense that, yes, the government had made an argument, but the Court of Final Appeal, in my opinion, went even further than government asked them to, in terms of what procedures would apply to sedition cases tried under, under the, the old British sedition law, law which yeah. is more mild than what's been up there. Yeah, because you, it was the sentencing was much so the, the, the Jimmy Lai case that I found very interesting was the one where he was convicted, basically, of violating his commercial duty. Yeah. Which doesn't For sound like a criminal case, uh, and is currently serving a prison term for that, even as he awaits trial on a much more significant serious uh, eluding the foreign collision. Yeah. yeah. So that sounds like a case which we see often in mainland China, where um, a bread and butter kind of ordinary legal violation or legal dispute, even commercial dispute that has no criminal element, is used to punish, including to imprison, um, by calling it fraud as opposed to just contract violation, is used to imprison people that the government wants to mm -hmm. imprison. And that sort of looks like this. Hmm. So how do you see the, the, the I, case? I think that your analysis is correct. Um, if, if, he were, if he were not Jimmy Lai, I don't think he would have been prosecuted for fraud in these circumstances. I mean, and, Jimmy Lai is the number one enemy, and I think, in Beijing's eyes. And I think the Hong Kong government is very keen to get him convicted of something, especially because 
it's not at all uh, clear that he is guilty of what they're saying he's guilty of, because I, in my opinion, Jimmy Lai was being careful in the sense that once the national security law went into force, he stopped calling for sanctions. He wasn't doing it, in my opinion, he wasn't. And if you read the court of first instance decision on bail, which was eventually overturned by the court of final bail, um, one of the points that the court of first instance made is that Jimmy Lai did have at least an arguable case, right, in the sense that it did appear that his actions calling for sanctions seem to have ended, right, when the law went into force. So I, to me, it's not at all clear that he will be convicted. We didn't, I mean, he's going to be testifying soon, right? His testimony will start in November. Uh, if we're very um, skeptical of the Hong Kong legal system now, we might say, oh, it's a slam dunk, of course he'll be convicted. But I'm not 100% sure he will. And I'm not 100% sure that if he is convicted, it will be upheld on appeal. Uh, because I do think it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, essentially what I think the prosecutors are trying to argue is that even though the national security law expressly says that it's not retroactive, that's supposed to be one of the good things about it, but the prosecutors are reaching back before the law went into force to look at his actions and using them as evidence of his intent and arguing that even though you stopped expressly calling for sanctions, that's what you were trying to do when you were critiquing the government. So I don't know, maybe he won't be convicted or maybe he'll get off on appeal. Well, if you're the Hong Kong government, you at least want to be able to tell Beijing, well, he served time for corruption, right? Mm -hmm. He served time for public order offenses. Mm -hmm. um, you see what I'm saying? I think that yeah, so from the Hong Kong Very clever strategy. <laughs> Hong Kong governments probably didn't know for sure whether they were going to get certain convictions. And so it was important to them, I think, this is my speculation, but I would think if I were the Hong Kong government, it would be important to me to be able to tell Beijing that the number one enemy, Benny Lai, is in jail for something. Jimmy, Jimmy Lai. Uh, Jimmy Lai, yeah, is in, is in jail for something, right? And that, he, because they didn't know how the cases were going to go. I think they, they've been more successful than maybe they expected, right? With the exception of these two acquittals for subversion, they got a great prosecution. Um, so maybe they weren't sure that that would happen. And maybe they wanted to make sure that Jimmy Just, I realized as we were speaking, we didn't explain what the lease dispute was about. Do you want to say it in a nutshell? Um, my understanding of it, and I'm not an expert on that case, but was that he was, he leased the premises for one activity for his publishing, and then he was using it for other activities as well, essentially. And yeah, more than one company. More than one company, yeah. Right. And, and so, so it was a, it was a breach of the lease terms. So normally you would think breach of contract there are some damages from it, then maybe you could get show, show your damages. <laughs> right, right. But, yeah. you know, the, I suppose it's not beyond, it's not impossible to make out a fraud claim for it because he would have made statements in the course of it. Again, I'm, I haven't followed that case really closely, so I don't want to say too much on it. But from everything I've read about it, it's a case that would not have led to jail time had he not been who he was. Because it wouldn't have been prosecuted. So um, I'm sure all of you are waiting impatiently to raise your questions. Uh, so uh, do I have any in the room? If not, I'm going to go to uh, Chris. Hi, thank you so much, um, Professor, for being here and sharing with us our ideas. I want to go back a little bit to the LGBTQ part. Um, and specifically, I think it's very fair to say that the court has been really still continuing the tradition of using LGBTQR um, as kind of a way to um, progress um, LGBTQ rights in Hong Kong. I think um, that's another piece to it is after the NSL, the Hong Kong government has been extremely regressive on reading the interpretation uh, or the rule that was given out by the uh, Court of Final Appeals. And it happened to the Q case where mm -hmm. the government has come up with a, a highly inappropriate, I think it's almost in bad faith, um, proposal to surveil trans people. And also, uh, because Q is a trans man, they have an other scheme um, for trans women, which still needs often surgery. Right. Um, and also, I think that 
applies as well to the Sanziki case where they would likely say it's impossible to get through uh, the legislature, so they're just going to throw their hands up and say we cannot comply with the two-year limit or do something in that phase also. So I, I just want to, uh, you to make a comment on that a little bit more. And, yeah. Well, I think you're absolutely right. The Hong Kong government has become, I think, more regressive on this issue since 2020. I think that has something to do with the change in government and the change in le the legislature. Because I'm not saying that everyone in the Legislative Council was progressive on these issues, but when you had competitive democracy, you had some more progressive people. Um, and I think there's been a change at the Equal Opportunities Commission as well, where there was a time when even though the Equal Opportunities Commission didn't have an ordinance to enforce, they still collected complaints and data um, they were, I think, receptive to the idea that the LGBT community deserves equal rights, right? Now, the Equal Opportunities Commission is like, nope, not, not our business, right? We don't have an ordinance to enforce, so they've taken a much more narrow approach. Um, so you're right. It Basically, the Hong Kong government, I think, is going to fight every possible progressive decision. and. I'm not so sure that I think they'll be able to just throw up their hands and say we can't get a bill through the ledge code, though, be with respect to legal recognition, because I think at some point the Hong Kong government might just do it. The Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal might just do it for them, right? They just might issue a declaration. And to some extent, we saw the same thing happen in Taiwan, right, where the Taiwan highest court said you have two years. And it was touch and go there, because they had these referendums, and there wasn't a as much public support as perhaps people hope, but eventually the job was done because there was a sense that you need to comply with the highest court's decisions. Um, so I do, while I, I agree with you, it's not, um, it's not a perfect situation by any means, but it's way better than it would be without the ICCPR. And I think the best comparator there is Singapore. Singapore has never ratified the ICCPR. Singapore only recently decriminalized and did so only because at the same time they put in a constitutional amendment saying no same-sex marriage. So I think if the ICCPR had applied to Singapore, they would have had to decriminalize much sooner. So international human rights law, I always say to my students, is, is not perfect and it can't achieve everything, but we're better with it than without it. Following up, should I assume then that the LGBT uh, decisions that you're describing in Hong Kong are more progressive than what you get in China? Oh, yes. So the ICCPR in that sense is a little different. Well, even if mainland China had ratified the ICCPR, which it hasn't, you don't have an independent judiciary to enforce it. So even if they had ratified it, even if they had you know, promised to comply with it, you're not going to get a court to order the government in mainland China to comply with its international human rights treaties, even though China is theoretically a modest legal system, you're not going to find court judgments in that case. It's a very interesting question, and there's only really one case that directly is on point, in my opinion, and that was the case that I mentioned uh, that where the Equal Opportunities Commission judicially reviewed the Hong Kong government's policy of allocating students to secondary schools. They were very competitive secondary schools, and in a nutshell, the Hong Kong government noticed about 20 years before this case that, oh my God, the girls are doing better on the test than the boys. And if we don't fiddle with the numbers, we're going to have more girls than boys in the elite schools. That's it in a nutshell. I'm oversimplifying. And the EOC asked them to change. They refused to change. There was a judicial review. It went before Justice Hartman in the um, court of first instance. And the Hong Kong government tried to justify their fixing of the numbers uh, as a form of affirmative action for boys. 
um, was sort of ironic, right? The idea, they tried to claim that boys develop later and that actually they were going to be great stars, but you just couldn't tell yet. <laughs> we needed to boost their scores to ensure that they would have equal representation in the elite schools. And the EOC argued that that was a misinterpretation of the sex discrimination ordinance, which did allow for voluntary affirmative action, but it was supposed to be there to correct sex discrimination, historic sex discrimination, not to boost boys scores, right? And the judge used the CEDAW treaty as a guide to interpreting that article in the sex discrimination ordinance. And I can give you a, an article discussing it. And he directly saying that it was applicable to Well, what he said is that we can see that the sex discrimination ordinance was enacted in part to implement Hong Kong's obligations under CEDAW. Because you see, what had happened with CEDAW is the British government ratified CEDAW, but initially did not apply it to Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong government asked to be left out. And that was because the colonial government knew they had tons of discriminatory policies. I could rattle them off for you. I wrote articles about this back in the 90s. And one of the goals of the women's movement was to get the Hong Kong government to accept CEDAW. And finally, in 1996, I mean, right up to the deadline, the, the British government did extend CEDAW to Hong Kong. And they discussed it with China as well, because they knew, but China had already so it shouldn't be a problem, right? And it was in 1995 that the Hong Kong government passed the Sex Discrimination Ordinance. And this was a compromise bill that was a response to Anna Wu's Equal Opportunities Bill, which would have prohibited discrimination on many more grounds. But the Hong Kong government managed to resist most of her bill, but they did agree to sex discrimination and disability discrimination laws. There were amendments that Anna Wu and other legislators tried to get into the sex discrimination bill that the government introduced to expressly provide that this was designed to implement CEDAW. Didn't quite get that in. But there's language in the preamble and the legislative debate that makes it clear that one of the reasons they're finally agreeing to legislate against sex discrimination, because it was the first sex discrimination law in Hong Kong, was because they had agreed now that CEDAW was going to be applying and they needed to comply with. Also, you can find statements from the Hong Kong government when they report to the CEDAW committee where they cite the sex discrimination ordinance as one of their ways of complying with CEDAW. So the judge was very open to arguments based on the CEDAW treaty. And this is what I mean when I say even in a dualist legal system, a lot depends on judicial attitudes. If judges are willing to look at what the government has said to the treaty monitoring body and when legislation was passed and the purpose of the legislation, they can often find enough evidence to show that that legislation or this government policy is intended to comply with international law. So if there is vague language, let's interpret it way to comply. And you see this around the world, right? I mean, sometimes people call this creeping monism. <laughs> where judges in dualist legal systems like India and some others have actually used treaties, even though they haven't been expressly incorporated in the way that the ICCPR has been incorporated in Hong Kong's Bill of Rights Ordinance. That being said, I think there's still a difference. I mean, you'd still if you're trying to rely on the treaty, you'd still rather rely on one that has been directly incorporated. And where it's really made a difference in Hong Kong is with ISCRA, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Litigants have tried to rely on it, and in one sense, they should have a good argument because it's described in Article 39 of the Basic Law in exactly the same language as the ICCPR. But there's no ordinance that essentially copies it. Implemented. The Hong Kong government will tell the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that we implement our obligations under this treaty through a variety of ordinances, 50 different ordinances and all these policies on housing and this and that and that. But the courts have said that's not the same as incorporating it in a, into one ordinance that we can directly enforce. That. So they still treat it really as an unincorporated treaty. So it does make a difference. So, Sorry, that might have been too long of an answer. I want to go to one of the um, 
questions from the online audience. They want to talk about the foreign judges mm -hmm. on the Court of Final Appeals. Um, so the question is, can you provide one example that provides, that, that, uh, provides evidence that their presence has made any positive impact, whether it be a fairer trial, uh, more meaningful judgment, or anything at all? And the, the person raising the question says, this is because I'm unable to recall anything positive other than the fact that they're making a lot of money. Um, this is the criticism. Yeah. And for the record, and I don't, I don't know, I haven't fact checked these numbers, but the, it says that the foreign judges are making more than 50 US dollars per month in Hong Kong, which would be $600,000 a year, although my understanding is they would not be paid for the month they're not paid in Hong Kong. So, right, right. So I don't think we have to do that math, but 50,000 US dollars per month, um, which they compare um, very favorably to the um, salaries of U.S. justices. <laughs> uh, so, this, so is this just a, um, a very comfortable gig? Um, now, this is not the words of the person who submitted this, submitted this question, but this has occurred to me that most of these judges are retired mm -hmm. um, judges from the apex courts of Canada, Australia, or the U.K., um, a lot of elderly mm -hmm. lords and ladies. Um, so this is a very nice retirement gig. Um, All right. Okay. Any, any well, the the first thing I want to first thing I want to say is I think we should pay our judges a whole lot more. Okay. I think we'd have fewer problems if we paid judges the way judges are paid in Hong Kong and Singapore, um, because if you want justice to be done and no uh, opportunities for corruption or no temptation for corruption, then pay your judges a lot more money. I think we should pay our senators, congressmen, president, everyone more money, but. To go to your question, I think the answer is we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. So in their deliberations, I think it is possible that foreign judges have made a difference over the years, perhaps less so since 2020. But I think it is possible that foreign judges have made a difference, but I have to agree with the questionnaire, you don't see um, big dissenting judgments, right? Now, in the recent case um, on the question of, that Margaret Ung brought and her group brought up on the question of whether the, the prosecution under the public order ordinance was disproportionate and whether you had a separate duty, there, there was a really interesting um, discussion there. I'm trying to remember, I, I wrote down in essence, it went to the question of whether you were going to follow British case law, um, where rather than just assessing whether the restriction in the law was a proportionate restriction on the right of public assembly, et cetera, whether you looked at the enforcement, enforcement that was taken in the prosecution itself. And we did see the Court of Final Appeal um, turn down the appeals um, and also not really embrace this British case law. Now, my understanding is that I think the British judge did write a separate opinion saying he did not disagree with the outcome, but would do so in a different way. And I, I, I have to read that before I can say whether it actually shows any difference. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally understand the skepticism, and it may be that these foreign judges don't make a difference. I honestly don't know. I would like to think that behind the scenes, they are offering views and comparative jurisprudence and perhaps finding ways to keep Hong Kong a little bit more connected to liberal democracies and other common law systems, but I can't say for sure. And if I were a foreign judge on the Court of Final Appeal, I might well resign for the obvious reason. You don't want to be seen as giving some kind of veneer mm -hmm. of rule of law to what is no longer a rule of law system for political offenses. But I do want to say, I still think that in the non-security cases, Hong Kong does still have a pretty good legal system that follows the rule of law. I think it's, unfortunately, it's like a dual state. A lot of people are using that term now to describe Hong Kong. 
if you're if you're unfortunate enough to be caught up in these political offenses, be they under the local ordinance, the new ordinance enacted in 2024 to implement Article 23, or the national security law that was imposed in 2020, if you're in that unfortunate group, you are kind of in a separate legal system. And I don't think there's much that any foreign judges can do to mitigate that. I think what we're hoping those of us who still have some hope for Hong Kong is that maybe eventually it can be quarantined a little bit. And maybe at some point the Hong Kong government will feel that it doesn't have to enforce the law to such an extreme, both with respect to you know, taking assets of NGOs and the speech, union, the speech therapist union now has been told they've got to cough up their assets, right? I mean, in addition to having gone to jail for sedition, I mean, it's just this over enforcement that I think goes beyond even what is necessary under the law. But somehow the Hong Kong government feels they have to do it. I don't know if they're getting direct directions that they have to do it or they're just so determined to please Beijing that they're overly enthusiastic. But I think my hope is that maybe eventually the Hong Kong legal system can be preserved and maybe even this one area where so much has been lost maybe the impacts can be made. So that's not a great answer to your question, but I cannot point to a, any case where it's clear that a foreign judge has really made a difference. Is that a hand? Yeah. Thank you for the discussion, Professor Peterson. So uh, I'd like to hold in on the relationship between the judiciary and the legislative council, uh, particularly in their halfway approach to, uh, to constitutional cases. So pre-2020, Hong Kong judiciary left the room open for judicial dialogue with the legislative council, where they would strike down an unconstitutional provision in a domestic uh, law, but leave it open to the legislative council to amend or create an alternate framework, similar to the Chinese case, and the government would be receptive to the comments. But if you were to adopt a more skeptical approach, what are the implications of the Hong Kong government does not listen to the judicial dialogue between the CFA and the state council? Can the judiciary enforce in any other way? Well, I guess the best test of that will be the decision in 2023, um, which the court final bill said you have to give legal recognition of the same effect couples, but it's really up to you to formulate it, right? So that is, to me, judicial legislative dialogue. Um, and I think it's kind of difficult for the Hong Kong government to say they can't accomplish it, because let's face it, they legislature now, right? It's not like the old days when there was constant fighting between the Legislative Council and the government. So I, I think the, the courts still are engaging in that dialogue in the sense they're giving them time to reform the law. But the question is whether the government will play ball and, and take the initiative to do it or whether they'll just sit back on their heels and refuse and do what you suggested they might do throw up their hands and say, we can't comply. I don't know what will happen then. I, what I would predict is that the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal might issue some declaration that from here on in, since you did not provide equivalent legal recognition, now you will have to grant marriage licenses. They might say that, right? Because that's the only way we can provide the legal recognition that they're entitled to, unless you create some alternative. That's what I would do if I were. Does that answer your question? Is there any other case you can think of that would show the court in Hong Kong doing something as proactive, if you will, as that successfully? Well, the Hong Kong courts have issued declarations on yeah. unlawfulness. Right, but this would require, basically would be telling the executive branch you should be issuing marriage, if I understood you correctly, which you should be issuing marriage licenses now to same-sex couples that come before you to register a marriage because you have failed to do what we asked and provide for an alternative framework. So now you're basically command, directly commanding the executive an branch issue of to, to take, yeah, yeah exactly. So right. is, that, is there any precedent for that happening in, in the Hong Kong system? I think if you look at some of the case law 
I'm trying to think now, a non-refoulement, it's mainly orders not to do something, right. do not deport someone. Mm -hmm. You're right that it's rare for them to say, I'm right to social welfare. Um, there, are, there were some successful challenges um, on the right to social welfare under the basic law, which I would have to go back and read, but I, my recollection is they did say you had to recognize certain people who they had excluded from social mm -hmm. welfare. They had rewritten the law to exclude recent migrants from mainland China. And in essence, that's by saying you can't exclude them, that means you're gonna have to give them benefits, right? So I'd have to go back and read it, but I, I think they're probably careful how they phrase it, it would be unlawful to exclude. Do they affirmatively order that? Mm -hmm. um, and in essence, it also, if you go back to the early um, right of the boat cases, right after the handover, you certainly, when the court said you cannot exclude certain people from their right to permanent residence, the court was essentially saying you have to recognize them. I mean, you would have to issue them their identity card that shows they have permanent residence. So again, I, those cases are, are old now, but I, I think if I went back and read them, you would find examples where, in essence, the government has been ordered to do something. I want to squeeze in one last quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you can think of a quick way of answering. <laughs> Is um, the connection, I'm curious about the connection between the Hong Kong legal system and the Commonwealth we're talking about these foreign judges who come from other you know, Commonwealth countries, the same legal tradition, British inheritance. Those connections on the one hand, uh, including licensing of lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so we have lawyers practicing in Hong Kong who have been licensed in uh, England and Wales and so on. Um, who, I, who I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, find it fairly easy to be articled in Hong Kong and to practice in Hong mm -hmm. Kong versus the connections between the Hong Kong legal system in China, mm -hmm. where there's pretty, there's still a large pretty, wall yeah. you know, of separation. Just yeah, it, it, it strikes me that the connections to the Commonwealth remain pretty stronger strong. professionally, if not, you know, but also in, in textually mm -hmm. versus the other direction. Do you think that there's an attempt now to sort of rip that out, you know, tear up the, the Well, that's, that's what I mean when I say we hope that the national security law and the new national security ordinance can be kind of quarantined. The hope mm -hmm. is that Hong Kong, apart from that area of law, will remain a common law legal system. And remember, Article 8 of the basic law, Hong Kong's regional constitution, says the laws of Hong Kong shall include, and it mentions legislative, blah, blah, blah. it says the common law, right? And so you do still see many references to the common law uh, throughout Hong Kong jurisprudence. And in fact, um, Tanpec Chi's appeal, um, that's one of the arguments that have been certified for, for appeal, I believe, which is the argument that even under the, old, under the old British law of sedition, his case was a common law offense that should have been tried by, it should have been tried in the high court with a jury, not in the district court. And so there, we're still seeing these references to the common law. And um, we'll see, but I, I don't think the common law is dead in Hong Kong by any means, but certainly many of the common law principles that influenced Hong Kong's criminal procedure are now dead in the context of security. Right. So in other words, a dual, um, dual state system might be a, a better option than a complete Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and when I go back to Hong Kong, and I've been back several times since 2020, um, many people often say that to me. They say, you know, please don't, because I ask them, well, what can one do when one is not in Hong Kong? And they say, well, please tell people that we are not Tibet, right? We, we do still have a different legal system. Things are tough, and a lot of things have changed, but we do still have greater freedoms and better procedural systems in our legal system that we want to protect. So that's why I'm always hesitant when someone says, shall we just sanction the judges? Because I think, well, what is the ultimate impact of that going to be? Are you going to improve things or are you going to make things worse? And 
maybe you, maybe the impact isn't that great one way or the other. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I do think that the slightly better outcome would be Hong Kong maintaining a common law legal system at least in areas outside of security cases. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I find that the most actually the most gripping aspect of your research because I think sitting outside Hong Kong, we all have this question of well, what is the right response? Do sanctions help? Uh, what would actually be helpful yeah. to um, to the cause of, of preserving some elements of um, I don't want to use the term rule of law, but uh, legal protections, recognition, protection of rights in Hong Kong. Um, so we continue to grapple with that. Thank you so much for oh, the talk welcome. and Thank all you of you for your participation and great questions. What a great thing. Thank you very much.